So Kaya and welcome to CCWA's fourth Environmental Matters for 2021. Thank you for all being here tonight. Um, it's wonderful to see you all live and also I can see the people online as well and there's lots of people around this country um, that have um, dialed in and are here with us tonight but not um, physically. So we uh, send a big shout out to them as well. Um, and it's, it's a very special um, update tonight um, on the Nuclear Free WA campaign. For those that don't know me, I'm KA. I am the Nuclear Free campaigner at the Conservation Council of Western Australia. Um, I've been in the position now um, for nearly four years. And prior to that, I walked around the world um, and organised um, walks and runs uh, for a nuclear free future future, but also um, with First Nations people across the country and across um, the world. So it's a different world that we live in today and a different world that um, we navigate. So it's all great to see face to face. Um, we've had to do these environmental matters online most of the time. Um, but before I really get into tonight, we're really privileged um, tonight and really welcome Uncle Ben Taylor and his nephew, Daniel Garlett, who will say a few words, but uh, welcome us to country but most of you know Uncle Ben here in Perth. Um, Uncle Ben Taylor Kumara um, is a familiar face here and particularly lots of protests um, in the Noongar community for fighting for equality for as long as many of us have been alive. Um, well, not me probably so much, but, <laughs> um, but Noongar and Uad Elder. Um, Uncle Ben is the member of the WA uh, Deaths in Custody Watch Committee. Um, and he's a familiar face around, around Perth and has done so much for his community, for land rights, for Aboriginal people. And I'll hand the floor over to Uncle Ben. Not working, this one is. Yeah. Thank you, Kay, and everyone here. Good to see you all. Uh, Carmen Lawrence and Hazel and all the rest of you. And uh, <clears throat> today I was up at King's Park, Fraser, Fraser Restaurant, giving encouragement to all our young Aboriginal <coughs> girls going through school, high school, telling them to go to year 11, year, year 10, year 11, and get on to a good way. Good education, we'll need you. you could be our next prime minister. I get a big applause. <laughs> and, you know, they were very good. And uh, there are a lot of good minders there, the Aboriginal elders, women looking after them in the schools and encouraging them, but good to see them at boarding. And the words I said to, the, to this land Kaya Wanya, in the Wild Nunga, where you're running. Now I'm more poor on you in work, really. The water meal, you know, in Pura, and the Jagan, Yalagonga, Capran, and Kumba, and around the water. Durbel Urigan. I welcome you onto the, the Durbel Urigan, the Swan River. It was our sacred place long before colonization. My father went down there in 1907, and they told him the same thing. My grandmother took me down there with that eye. And she said, Corlin, I need a water, we are, you know, where spirit of this land will always be with us, whether we live or die, is in the trees, in the waters, in those animals. 
and I've been telling anthropologists, main roads people, you know, that's all spirit there, you can't damage that. We've had, you know, the row eight down there. So Mr. McGowan got in and we stopped it. He done that for us. So today the road to nuclear free future for WA is very sad. You know, fracking, they ruin the land, killing the animals, the birds, the spirit too, people, all throughout. And KA is with other Aboriginal people, been to Leonora and everywhere, you know. Wallona, marching up that road, Scott Ludlam, they were all part of that protest down here, up to Kalgoorlie. So the ground, you know, this ground is sacred. And you know, when I I heard from the history of uh, Captain Cook, his botanist said this land is most sacred. And these Aboriginal people, this the land um, they don't own the land, the land owned them. And he's saying that in 17th century, you know. And uh, so today, <clears throat> as we stand on the sacred ground, I know that the water where you know, will always be in the spirits and they're going to kill them spirits. And, you know, we have original people, we all know, me as an elder in my 80s, that when we die, our spirit will always be with our loved ones, our children and our family. And watch over the land always. We buried an Aboriginal elder down at yeah, um, uh, Punana last week. She said to me, Brother, when I pass on, you say those words. And I went down there and I said that. So, you know, she knew before she died that her spirit will always be there, same as I do. So we must fight against this nuclear fracking, all part of destroying this land, this sacred place. And I know you're all here, I'm talking to the converters. I'll hand it over to Daniel to say something, my granny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, always puts me in an uncomfortable position, being younger. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Ballard and um, yeah, so I'm a, a Balladong, uh, Eward, and a Wajuk man as well. Um, I'm a man of many, actually, uh, through different grandparents, all the way up to, uh, from Eucla, all the way up to Northern Territory, Sri Northern Territory. So it's fair to say that um, uh, I follow traditions, not, um, yeah, I don't uh, vary. There's no variations from traditions with me. I'm a traditional man, and those traditions, um, for me, are at the uh, utmost uh, importance about um, you know, who I am, what I stand for, um, you know, my hopes, my visions for our country. Um, I'm, uh, I suppose after the next generations, it's going to come to me. And um, you know, it's been an honour to, to uh, fight um, and lobby for change for so long. I've uh, been doing it for 34 years, which doesn't seem um, like a, lo a lot of years looking at the audience we have, no offence, uh, but you know, to me, uh, this journey started, it started when I was a boy and, and age and wisdom is the very essence of life. And so, you know, I'm standing here, um, you know, in the presence of elders of all sorts of uh, walks of life with great honour, um, you know, pledging that when it does come to my time that you'd be rest assured that, um, uh, your wishes and respects for a you know a brighter country, a, a healthier country, um, will be greatly invested. Uh, you know in my endeavours. Um, uh, went into the state election um, on Brad Pettit's ticket, and um, we was you know lucky enough to get Brad in. Um, no offence to come, uh, being a being a Labour. A lot of my family had, uh, have come strong, um, uh, strong. Uh, ties to the Labour Party, always have, probably always will. But in saying that, um, 
I should be the uh, candidate for BERT in the federal election for the Greens. And I, you know, look forward to the challenges that that, that you know, sets, uh, you know, me on that path and hopefully uh, to gather support for change. Um, one of the things that um, I'm particularly extremely, um, you know, devoted to is country. Country, it's always been about country to me. Um, you know, pe people, people, meaning all of us, um, that we have a responsibility and we're all guilty together, all of us. And that also means my people too. That, you know, we, it, it, what it needs is, is um, you know, honesty about our role and how we're continuing to, um, you know, cause destruction on, on country. And this goes right out uh, from my knowledge, um, you know, traveling right across Australia, out into the most repart, uh, remote parts of this country. I've been there and I've done it. So I speak with on hands, um, you know, traveling out to these remote places to see how the Western world is seriously affecting the way that, you know, we live right out in the most remote parts of, of country. And also, um, you know, sitting down with the elders, you know, telling them about, um, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about the Western world, how it's, uh, you know, impacting in these uh, smaller places. So um, I also, you know, I've, I've been a, a very big fan of uh, environmental groups and I've worked, um, you know, for over 20 years in natural resource management programs um, as a regional development uh, manager, uh, you know, with the claimants from all of Metro before Metro was registered with the Native Title Act. Um, I was in charge of that group. So I certainly had a lot of dog fights um, with main roads in, in terms of row eight, what had happened there. Um, and also, you know, being in charge, uh, in charge of the claim group from South West Pajara, uh, Pemberton, Margaret River, uh, Busselton, you know, down that way, um, you know, fighting, you know, vigorously with all sorts of tactics to stop fracking down that way, where I may have jeopardised my position in that role because of personal feelings. Um, yeah, I know that everybody's got a job to do at the end of the day, but I'm a man of morals and principles. And if it is not right, well, then I'm not doing it and the job's not worth it. So, you know, um, keep an eye out for who I am. And if I can be of assistance to, um, you know, this particular group, what it's about, the road to nuclear free uh, future for WA, I think that ultimately um, I'm quite pleased in how far we've come in such a short time with the whole world realizing that. Um, something drastic needs to happen, and slowly uh, everybody's catching up to 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 my visions, what I had as a boy for um, you know more healthy, healthier environment, and you know the protection of country, and the very essence of what country means, the embodiment of of country, and how that impacts every single human being living on it, regardless of your background or ethnic background or where you come from, that we it is there. And, uh, you know, we're seeing high rates of um, mental illness uh, problems uh, associated with ripping up country. And so, you know, um, there's certainly links there. And, um, yeah, thank you for allowing me to say a few words. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, if you ever need my assistance, whatever it is, I'm available. Thanks, Daniel. That was great. And um, we will be calling on you because we all need assistance um, all the time in this campaign. It's a long campaign. And as you'll hear um, tonight, um, how long the journey has been. Um, tonight, we are um, celebrating and um, well, before I begin, sorry, I'd like to also acknowledge that tonight we are meeting on Wadjuk Noongar Budja and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, and those that are emerging. And I acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded and it was always, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Tonight, we're excited to launch the uh, next stage of the WA Nuclear Free Campaign with the report Beyond Uranium Mining, A Road to Nuclear Free Future for WA. This, this report is about a culmination of the powerful um, and sustained story of resistance while also providing a blueprint for managing the risks associated with uranium mining. Um, and it also highlights the new hope um, and the real opportunities to protect WA from the threat of uranium mining in a lasting and meaningful way. 
As you know, um, the environmental approvals for the four proposed uranium mines, Kintyre, Waluna, Yiliri and Mulga Rock were fast tracked by the Barnett government in an attempt to establish this industry, this uranium mining industry in WA. In addition, uranium exploration activities have been undertaken during the Barnett government, which has left a legacy of uranium exploration sites across WA. But tonight, AMWU State Secretary Steve McCartney, Deputy Chair of Mineral Policy Institute, Mayor Pepper, and CCWA's President Carmen Lawrence will be launching the report um, and highlighting this powerful and sustained story of resistance and the depth and connection and continue, um, the continuance of support for communities um, at the forefront of these proposed uranium projects. We have a very powerful and um, special film uh, that features voices uh, from traditional owners from all the four areas. Um, and then the presentations will be followed by question and answer session. Um, and a special shout out to those, as I said, to um, those joining us online. It's a bit tricky and we're a bit short on staff today um, with some of the CCD, CCWA um, staff members being sick. And so I'm sort of multitasking. I shouldn't be doing the tech stuff and emceeing, but that's what you do. You just have to roll with it sometimes. And we're used to in this campaign and many others know what it's like just to keep rolling. And, um, and that's why it's been such a powerful campaign. Um, from those in the audience here tonight, hold on, your, hold on to your questions um, until the very end. And if you're with us by Zoom, post your questions up on the Zoom chat and our Zoom team, which is Maggie, uh, will flag it for any, for any of the question and answering at the end. Um, I'm honoured to take this position as MC um, as the Nuclear Free Campaign. Um, here in WA, the Nuclear Free Campaign as I said, is a very long campaign um, and it's driven by the communities at the forefront of these proposed projects. And it gives me great hope and ongoing determination to keep WA Uranium Free working beside all of our speakers tonight um, and all of you here tonight. So a big thanks. One of the projects that we're currently working on um, is a photographic booklet um, of Yuliri um, that Yuliri has been um, for 50 years now, um, the communities have resisted this uh, um, project. And in the research, we've been finding media articles dating back to the mid seventies um, of opposing uranium mining for many people, but in particular, the staunch trade union movement. Back then it was the Trades and Labor Council. And today, Steve McCartney, the state secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union to, continues this legacy, he is one of our strongest outspoken allies who continues to maintain um, advocate um, for no uranium mining in Western Australia. The AMWU work towards protecting their workers and have been concerned about the hazards of uranium mining for a very long time. Steve has always got time for our campaign and to have a chat with us, although lately we haven't caught up with him, so it's great to see him here tonight. And um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Steve McCartney to the stage. You can, you can leave it there and I reckon okay. you'll probably add enough. I reckon yep. I'll make it across the line somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stand back here that might call that and uh, I'll do my juggling out for the book. Okay, uh, look, I'd just like to also acknowledge the fact that we're on our land, but also acknowledge the fact that we're standing here with two very strong uh, countrymen, along with other countrymen, that are doing a lot of good work for Western Australia. And uh, thanks for that, Uncle Ben and others. Look, uh, I stand on the shoulders of um, the Tony Cooks and the Keith Peckhams and the Wally Pritchards of uh, Western Australia that took this fight on before I was engaged in it at all. But what, what I did do growing up and uh, growing up with these people as mentors and people that I looked up to was that uh, I got a better, I got a good understanding about what was right for workers and what was right for the country are using the same thing. And uh, I think we also learned a very valuable lesson with asbestos. Uh, especially uh, the mining industry and, uh, and also uh, people in the maritime union and also people in manufacturing as well uh, and maintenance. We're doing work on those particular gear and still suffer today and some of their families are still, still suffering, whether it be loss or um, uh, uh, helping the people that are still trying to survive that horrible disease. So for a long time, we've always been uh, aware 
and in making sure that our members are working in a safe environment. And we don't see uranium as anywhere near a safe environment for workers to work. You know, well, I put the asbestos test on nearly everything. Uh, if they want to make, if we want me to make a decision about going in to support a mining operation or supporting an operation anywhere, one thing I'll be, I'll make sure of is if they're going to be digging it up, it's not going to affect the people that are working on it and digging it up. It's not going to affect the people while you transport it and it's not going to affect the end user. And I can't see any situation where uranium is mined where it doesn't fail those three tests. Uh, it affects the people that dig it up to the point where they have to wear radiation identification marks to make sure they don't absorb too much. And for a little while in the past, they didn't have it coordinated Sorry, nationally. So you could work in Adelaide and move too, too far on your metre and then go get a job in the next mine and make that your starting point. So that happened continually until it became a national event because when people work in those industries, they knew, how they, they knew that that's where they're going to make their money. I think they disregarded the safety aspect of it and maybe didn't believe in it. But I'm sure they're paying a price now. You know, once one the first step for making it a little bit safer was, I think, nationalising the whole thing and making sure that we had a national standard for this horrible stuff. I hope the next national standard is we eradicate it completely and never use it again. And you know what I what I wanted to speak about uh, at the uh, at the, uh, the national ALP uh, conference was about um, uh, rum jungle. You know, how can we justify absolutely doing anything to do with uranium in the future when we haven't actually fixed up the past? You know, when rum, rum jungle is still alive and well, still becomes an issue for people and countrymen, you know, people on their country still can't go back to rum jungle uh, from 1956 and now it's in the 2021. And what sort of legacy do we leave our country if we do do that? And that's the sort of education that we got off the Tony Cooks, the Keith Peckhams and others early on in our trade history and our trade understanding and my education as a trade, as a trade unionist. And as the president of the Trades and Labor Council, I hope I'm continuing that on, that legacy on. Because like you and your family, uh, we want to make sure people in our industry uh, maintain a legacy that it protects workers that ensures their family is going to be protected when, the, when their husband come, or husband or partner comes home from work and make sure that the end product doesn't affect the whole community. We're a left socialist union. And when we rise the wages and conditions of workers, we want to rise the social minimums as well. And it's the same about safety. We're going down, we're going down the road at the moment in Western Australia to build probably one of the best um, state safety regimes for workers uh, that we've had in a very, very long time. Thanks to, the, thanks to the government that we've got in place now. What we want to do is exactly the same thing, but with uranium. We want to make it safe for workers. We want to make it safe for people. We might want to make it safe for transport. This is a golden opportunity for this government. If you read this document, and if you understand that these uh, EPA uh, approvals are all coming up again, you know, and if you see the good policies that the ALP has got uh, that say how they, they don't want uranium mining, now they want to make sure that we don't want to have the scourge of uranium mining. This is their opportunity. This is our opportunity as a state to make sure that we get a position from the government that says we're not going to look at those EPA uh, proposals anymore because we know the general outcome, no matter what they happen to rig the figures and make it sound like for an EPA approval when they, you know, what is it? The answer to pollution is dilution. So uh, when you're talking about the range of mine, and our first country and countrymen are down there at the local watering hole where they've gone all their lives for, for, their, for their whole past, right? And it's declared by a ranger that 0 0.005 is a safe level uh, of radiation, but they don't dare measure it in the wet because in the wet, it goes straight down through the tailings dam and straight back into that pool. And when you've got a life expectancy of about 43 as a nation in that area, you've got to ask yourself the question, are we responsible by even letting this happen in the first place? And what we're going to be asking the state government and what we're asking people 
like yourselves and like other people inside the union movement to all push this opportunity, this opportunity to say, no, we don't want to approve those. We don't want to approve those EPAs. We don't want that to happen. Because even if your figures say it's okay, we know Rum Jungle tells us, Rum Jungle tells us that it's not okay. The people that are dying at 43 at Ranger are saying it's not okay. And the union movement is saying it's not okay. Thanks for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Oh, I need to move this uh, the video screen. I'm a bit shorter than Steve for those that don't know and can't see. Um, thanks, Steve. It's fabulous to have you always with us and um, and those and those staunch words. And and as you said, you're always being been here um, with this campaign and always has been. But I'd also like to acknowledge that there's lots of people in online um, in Melbourne, um, Dave Sweeney from the Australian Conservation Foundation, Joe Valentine's at the back, um, for Senator for the Greens, former Senator for the Greens um, with us tonight. There's Tim from the Wilderness Society here. So there's lots of organisations, there's lots of people here that have been concerned for a very long time that I just want to also make sure that people are acknowledged and organisations are, um, you know, acknowledged as well, because it's not just one person doing this. Um, the next speaker is someone I greatly admire and I'm honoured to work beside. Her diligent and unrelenting work is inspiring. Mia Pepper is the Deputy Chair of the Mineral Policy Institute and has campaigned on uranium mining issues for over a decade or more. And she recently completed a master's in environmental policy and mining regulation and has a strong interest in mine rehabilitation and uranium mining. She is the lead author of The Road to a Nuclear Free Future for WA. And we welcome Mia via Zoom platform where she now resides in Newman. So just bear with me with this tech stuff because I'm not great at it, um, but we will get her up on the screen in a minute. Hi everyone online and hi everyone at the State Library. Sorry, can't see me and sorry I, I'm not there. <clears throat> Should I kick off? I think so. Great, well, um, yeah, it's very nice and strange to be part of a live event and an online event. Um, and it was really great to, to see Steve and, um, and hear about and just be reminded and I think start the conversation with the fact that we have stopped mining for uranium in Western Australia for such a long time. And as Steve uh, stands on the shoulders of giants in the trade and labour um, movement, uh, KA and me and other nuclear free campaigners now stand on the shoulders of giants in the environment movement and also um, just very, very strong leaders in country who, um, who know the story about the places that they uh, look after. And we're really lucky to have been led and guided by that, that um, very long standing traditional knowledge about the risks and danger of uranium mining. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, calling in from Bumbajina, um, from Nebuli country. And here we're stuck between, well, we're very close to an iron ore mine and lots of dust and, um, a little further on there's Wittenoom and so people here know a lot about asbestos and then on the other side out to the east is the Kintyre uranium mine proposal which has been fought against um, since since the 80s um, when they discovered uranium in and around uh, the Kalamili National Park and um, and sparked the homelands movement of people going back onto country to protect it from uranium mining so yeah the history is long and we are now at a very exciting kind of point in history where we've got a Labor government in who is opposed to uranium mining. Um, and we're, you know, dealing with the legacy of a decade of exploration and mining, uh, mine proposals. Um, and we do have an opportunity now to enshrine some of the values about protecting country from uranium in law and uh, preventing any of these four projects from going ahead. So I'll, I'll kick off the presentation. Um, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna start with talking about what's happening with the uranium exploration 
projects and the mines and then give a little snapshot of the broader nuclear landscape and end with our three kind of campaign asks um, and where we see this campaign going, the pathway, the pathway for a nuclear free future. So <clears throat> many of you will know that when the uh, Liberal Barnett government came into power, they lifted a long, um, long standing ban on uranium mining. And it was at a time when the uranium price was uh, yeah, fluctuating, but it was still relatively high and valuable. And we saw just a huge uh, scourge of uranium exploration across the state. And there were 85 um, known uranium exploration projects across the state. Um, what's really interesting now is that the uranium price is low and we've got an anti-uranium government in power, is that those companies have started to disappear. And now the risk, and, and like Steve mentioned with Rum Jungle, um, there is a legacy even from exploration mining. Um, and what we want to avoid now is that those companies depart before they have, and we have ensured that the rehabilitation of those exploration sites has happened. So what was really interesting when we first looked at all the companies um, and the 85 sites, was that there were still quite a lot of active sites and sites that had owners or holders. And in the last six months, we've seen a doubling of companies, um, a doubling of uh, projects or sites without an owner. So the risk of these companies abandoning ship without rehabilitating is, is real and one that we want to avoid from happening. So. Um, with any mining tenement, there are there are requirements to rehabilitate. It's a big project, and that would be a good one if anyone wants to volunteer to actually go through and track what all of those requirements are for these eighty five sites. And many of those eighty five sites have a number of tenements. Um, but what we would really like from this government is some dedicated uh, pressure on those companies that still exist to ensure that they are rehabilitated or require bonds so that the government can ensure that there's funding to rehabilitate those sites. So <clears throat> as we've already said, in this last 10 years, um, you know, when Barnett, you know, was promising that there was gonna be thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of investment and um, at least 10 mines, we've got none. There are no active mines in WA, which is just so fantastic and we're really happy about. Yeah. <laughs> but there are four conditionally approved mines. Um, and so... Um, yeah, when, when the McGowan government came into power, um, they were caught in a tricky position because um, the Barnett government had raced through the approval of at least three mines within a month of the state election. So they were fast-tracked, they were dodgy. The, the whole process at, at the state government, you know, we found a lot of problems with. And if you get your hands on a copy of the actual report, um, you'll be able to see that, yeah, for each of the four projects, there's really specific environmental uh, reasons why none of those mines should go ahead and why the environmental approvals were um, deficient. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so each of the ministerial approvals for those four projects have a whole set of conditions. None of them are completely approved. None of them are ready to start mining tomorrow. They need um, water licenses, clearing permits. They need um, indigenous land use agreements, export licenses. They need a mine closure plan and a mining plan approved by the Department of Mines. None of these projects have all of those things. Um, <clears throat> and the other really important thing for us now is that each of these mines have a condition and it's condition three on each of the four approvals. And this is the text. 
it says that the proponent shall not commence the mine after five years from the date of this statement. And, any, um, and that they have to demonstrate to the CEO that they have made substantial commencement of mining. <clears throat> so there's a lot in this and I'll, we'll talk through it because it's important for us to know in the lead up to this next six months of the campaign where we, um, where we wanna really knock these projects on the head. So the Kintai project, that approval expired in March, 2020. And this one's a really interesting one because it's now well over 12 months and they still don't have an amendment to that condition. So they never, um, they, we understand that they sought to get an extension and then they withdrew that. So there's, they can't mine. That condition three prevents Kin, uh, Cameco from mining at Kintyre right now. Um, Mulga Rock, their uh, approval expires in December and Yaliri and Waluna, they both expire in January 2022. So beyond January 2022, if all goes well, there'll be no mine that commence, can commence mining in WA because of that condition. So that, that removes the environmental approval barrier. Um, <clears throat> the tricky bit is now for what does substantial commencement mean? So um, with, with Yaliri, with Kintyre, with Waluna, there's really, the companies are really not seeking to progress those mines in the next six months. The one that we're worried about is Mulga Rock. Um, and Mulga Rock is actively using this language, substantial commencement. They're trying to say, we will be, we will have substantially commenced mining by December, 2021. That's what they're telling their shareholders. Um, and so we've started asking the question, well, what, what is substantial commencement? And there is no definition in the Mining Act or in the Environmental Protection Act. So it's a sticking point. Um, and this is what we think substantial commencement should be, that it's all of the secondary approvals, everything, permits, licensing, agreements, particularly an Indigenous land use agreement, the second one is a financial investment decision. So a company needs to make that decision um, and they need to get financing and that would demonstrate substantial commencement. And then the third one, active on the ground construction. And what we're really worried about and what we think Vimy Resources who are driving the Mulga Rock project think is that they would only need to tick that third one, active on the ground construction. And what that would do is mean that if that was the only benchmark that this government considered, it would be sending a signal to the mining industry. If you do strategic environmental destruction, if you start clearing land and pouring concrete, you're over the line. And that's really dangerous. It's the worst possible outcome because what you would see is companies like Vimy Resources scrambling to make that footprint in a you know in an almost pristine environment um, just to prove this just to hold on to that environmental approval and that, so that's what we're worried about between now and December is that Vimy is seeking to do that so they're they're seeking clearing permits um, they've got works approval applications in before the Department of Environment they've got an active mine closure plan and mine plan before the Department of Mines um, and if they get that works approval, um, we think that they'll start clearing land, pouring concrete and try to prove that they've made substantial commencement. And what we're advocating for is that that can't be the only benchmark for this government to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I was going to talk here a little bit about the four, the four projects, but... Um, all I really think that it's so important to understand is that um, that really Yaliri and Kintyre, they're owned by a huge company, Cameco, based in Canada, who mine uranium. Um, they've got a lot of operating mines. They've got mines in care and maintenance. 
um, and they've downscaled production because of the low uranium price. And so before they even think about starting Yaliri or Kintyre, they would ramp up production at their existing mines. Um, so there, yeah, there's really no immediate risk for Yaliri and Kintyre to start. Waluna, they've they had a original project that got approved in 2013. Um, they could see that that project wasn't feasible, so they expanded it. They got approval for that. They're saying now to their shareholders that that's not feasible either, and they're looking at a new project altogether, and they've started looking for nickel and gold. Um, so Waluna is really dead in the water. But Mulga Rock, and we think Mulga Rock is not feasible, um, we know that Mulga Rock is in, a, in the Yellow Sand Plain Priority Ecological Community. It's home to the rare and endangered Sandhill Dunnart, um, the migratory Rainbow Bee Eater visits Mulga Rock. It's an important and beautiful part of the world. And it's also part of a story of, of really generations of nuclear um, displacement. So Mulga Rock is close to a community called um, Kunana, and before that it was Kundalit, where Spinifex people, people known as Spinifex people, um, were moved off their country in South Australia from the Maralinga weapons testing and resettled there and joined with Wongatha people um, and looked after that area and that country. And now again, um, that community is being threatened by the other end of the, the nuclear cycle, uranium mining. Um, and they've got an active, there's an active native title claim in this area, the Upali Upali Narita people. And um, Mulga Rock has, I mean, Vimy Resources, sorry, has for the longest time denied, actively denied people's connection to this country, which we think is wrong and hurtful. Um, and they're now in a position where they have to negotiate. So um, they're a long way from getting social license for this project. Um, and yeah, but they are really ideologically driven. They want this mine, they've got a clear deadline and they're doing everything they can to try and, um, to try and get over the line before December this year. So I just, it's really, I would just really grateful for the opportunity to talk to everyone about that one tonight and put that on your radar so that you know um, if there's anything that you can do or anything to watch in this campaign, it's what happens with Vimy Resources and Mulga Rock between now and December. Um, the broader nuclear landscape and why Mulga Rock is so crazy is that the uranium price has been stagnant for so long. Um, and Toro's chairman uh, in July put it perfectly, no one can get financing for a uranium mine in Australia. The reality is it doesn't make economic sense to mine uranium and it doesn't make it even less so in Australia. Mia, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I think the laptop um, in the venue is just about to run out of battery, so they're about to do a very quick changeover. Okay. Um, so I think you should still be good. They should, oh no, they might not actually be able to hear you, so you might just need to hold. Sorry, everybody, for technical difficulties. Okay. I don't know what to do now. Shall I stop talking? <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Yeah, can you hear us? We can. Yeah. Can you hear me? Are we back on? Sing instead. Um, I'm not sure you want to hear me sing David Noonan. <laughs> <laughs> We're not hearing Mia here in Perth. Can so, you hear me? Um, can you hear me, Ko? <laughs> people are sending in messages saying they're amazed at how well it's worked so far <laughs> and it would be working brilliantly if my battery on my computer worked yeah we know zoom is working okay but we're not working here at our end in 
We can't hear Mia. Ah, oh, here we go. You're back online. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, sorry, everyone. Great. Well, um, I was just going to stick the boot in really about how badly the nuclear industry is performing. Um, I was just talking about the uranium price and how it just is, it doesn't make economic sense right now to open uh, new uranium mines. And so, you know, what is even more dangerous than a uranium mine is an uneconomic uranium mine because that's when you see companies walk away and leave a terrible mess for governments to clean up. Um, so, yeah, again, if you get your hand on the report, um, we look at how much money the companies have. We look at the liability of the just the exploration project, so before they even start mining. Um, but, look, the cost of rehabilitating a uranium mine is phenomenal, and we can see that with Rum Jungle at the moment, like um, Steve was talking about, just to not even to fully rehabilitate that site, but just to... Um, just to mitigate the worst of it is uh, a bill of 300 million. Uh, the Ranger Uranium Mine in the Northern Territory, another celebration. It closed its doors in January this year. Um, they've stopped mining at Ranger after over about 40 years. Um, and they've got a rehabilitation bill of $1 billion. And if you read their rehabilitation report, there's still a lot missing and still a lot lacking from it. Um, so, you know, the cost of these things and cleaning up the mess is phenomenal. So, um, yeah, as I say, what's worse than a uranium mine is an uneconomic one because of that, that liability and the risk to taxpayers. So beyond uranium mining, if we look globally, there's a lot happening around nuclear power at the moment. Um, as the world wakes up to climate change and starts to take that seriously, the nuclear industry have really put it upon themselves to try and be um, the next in line, the alternative to coal. Um, and they've, you know, invested a lot of time in lobbying uh, governments. And we saw just two weeks ago, someone in the Nationals put forward a motion, an amendment in federal parliament to lift the ban on nuclear power in Australia. Um, and we'll see, we'll see it again and again and again. Um, but, you know, we're fortunate that both the ALP and the Liberal Party um, oppose nuclear power. Well, the Liberal Party keeps saying it would need bipartisan support and the ALP is and we hope will remain very strongly opposed to nuclear power for all of the reasons Steve mentioned before. Um, but the good news is that we are seeing huge growth in renewable energy. Um, and for the first time, it's overtaken nuclear. Um, and if you add in other types of renewable energy, it's, it surpasses nuclear quite, quite a lot. Um, I, I guess this graph, I just wanted to point out two things. That of the 415 reactors, what's really um, confronting at the moment in the changing climate is that over well over half of them, 350 of those um, are now operating at, have been operating for 30 years and a bunch of those have been operating for 40 years. So they're operating well towards the end of their, their design life um, and a lot of them will have to be um, decommissioned very soon. Um, that's really important to know because lots of uh, nuclear power companies are trying to push out the, the lifespan. So they're trying to get extensions to operate them beyond their design life. Um, and that's, that's risky for a, um, a whole lot of reasons, but mostly um, in the context of climate change is because they weren't designed with climate change in mind and, and what, what we're about to face. Um, the other figure is the, the 53 under construction and the 93 of abandoned constructions. But 53 um, of those reactors have been under construction um, for over a decade. Um, and some of them have been under construction for over 30 years. Um, so when we're looking at how nuclear could deliver in the future, um, we're seeing that they're going to, a lot of reactors will be decommissioned and that those under construction are over budget and behind schedule. And so there's going to be a big gap. They, you know, what the, the industry is going to struggle to maintain status quo. So 
if that all, you know, pans out the way we think it will, the demand for uranium um, will continue to stay low and stagnant and the demand for uranium slow and stagnant, which I guess takes us to the asks because really there is no better time than with an anti-uranium mining government in power with the end of any kind of binding environmental approvals for these four projects. There is no better time than beyond January 2022 to legislate against uranium mining in Australia, in Western Australia. So we've got the policy ban from this government, but what we really want is to legislate that ban. So when, when a Liberal government may, maybe not actually in WA, but at some point in the future, if they ever came into power again, um, you could foresee that those companies would try to um, seek to change that condition to reactivate their environmental approval. And so the strongest protection, the pathway out of all of this is to legislate a ban on uranium mining. And so beyond January 2022, the campaign will really be focused on, well, let's do that. Let's lock that in. The industry is going down. Um, we know the risks. We know the dangers. Um, let's just protect ourselves, give communities who have been fighting for nearly 50 years the peace of mind to know that their country is, is safe and protected from this toxic industry. The other two asks are, yeah, that the 85 exploration sites be rehabilitated and that beyond January 2022, that none of those four proposed mines have their environmental approvals extended. Um, so, yeah, we really look forward to working with everybody to get those three asks over the line, um, clean up country and protect country and move on because there's plenty of other fights to fight and we'd rather not fight this one anymore. <laughs> Man, that was awesome. Can you hear me everyone and on Zoom? Yep, okay. Great. Um, as always, Mia speaks amazingly, and um, thanks. It, and um, apologies for the tech tech side of things, but um, we got there in the end. And we have been, and many of the communities have been so patient over fifty years. This is only a five minute interruption um, in our life, so we can sort of use that to our advantage. Um, Mia was in this position before myself and did an extraordinary amount of work. She is well recognised within this family of anti-nuke campaigners. She is um, respected and, and is diligent in her work. She is thorough um, and, and continues to be um, while juggling family commitments. And um, Mia, just want to do a big shout out and say thanks for all your work and your continued time and effort and advocacy work. Um, that you have de dedicated to this campaign. Um, the, the report, it has been launched by me and now, and um, we have got it uploaded on our website for those. We haven't got many hard copies, um, so download that and we'll give you all the details before you leave. But what I love about this report is um, the, the evidence-based approach that me has done, but also um, there's a section on, and it's a beautiful section, and I'll just bring it up because I don't think many of you have seen it so far, um, that we have done the, um, the story, the 50 years of resistance to uranium mining. And I don't know whether you can see that online, but it's, you know, weaving the stories as well as the hard evidence and the real um, opportunities that um, is, you know, as um, Mia said, uh, there's so many opportunities for Labor to, to move on this. So um, make sure you do download a copy. There's the, yeah, up online, the 50 years of resistance to uranium mining. Um, and it's just beautifully done. Um, so thanks, Mia. That's, that's wonderful. Um, we are going on to... So the long struggle of First Nations, the resistance... Um, and it highlights the very real risk associated with uranium mining while providing the new hope um, and the real opportunities to protect WA from the threat of uranium mining in a lasting and meaningful way. 
This report um, we have mailed out to each of the Labor ministers, the MLCs, the MLAs, along with all the union um, secretary and leaders. So they will have their copy um, last week in their mailbox and we hope you know, we'll be contacting them over the, the coming weeks and months to, to make sure that they've read it and they know what we're asking. Um, the voices of traditional owners are at the forefront of our campaign. It's where we continually work together um, with them about how best to amplify their voices. In the climate that we live in today with COVID, it's a real struggle sometimes to have them come down to Perth. Um, but so we put together, or Mia again has put together a um, beautiful uh, voices from the traditional owners from each of the uh, four sites. And it's just a four minute, if we can get the technology to work, um, we'd love to show you um, and, and hear from them um, now. Not kinda yang kalau jual orang pernah. Kinda yang aku mana wajib ngaji ni kelam lagi. Ulu, ni nak kunci nama. We don't need uranium in this country. We got plenty of sun. We got plenty of ideas. But in the name of Jesus, we don't want uranium mining in this country. Uranium and the original Why you Uranium mining um, in my area or my country, I see there is no future for that. I don't want uh, uranium mining in my area, my land. Uh, my husband and I, we've been talking against fighting against uranium for the last 40 years. But although we still um, are worried that if this mine do go ahead, then it'll have a huge impact on the environment. And I remember back in 1972, when our old people were still alive, and I was only a young girl, and I was living on the Leonora Reserve, and I remember our grandfathers used to say, one day in the future, back then, they were giving the government warning about our, our sacred sites and our heritage. And they all got together and they had a meeting and they said, we do not want any type of mining to go ahead in and around the Yaliri um, area because of the significant science. And 50 years, almost 60 years later, I'm here and I realise that I've got to continue fighting, picked up from where they left off because I like to see my grandchildren enjoy this land and know that this is where my ancestors and their ancestors come from. So thank you. We say no to uranium. Want the uranium? Leave it in the ground. There's some familiar faces there that people have uh, walked with and spoken to and been a part of their lives for a very long time. So it's really special to see that. So thanks again, Mia, for not only putting the report together, but also putting that short video together of those voices that we work with um, 
on those four sites of um, Kintyre, Waluna, Hiliri and Mulberry Rock. We look forward to the day when communities threatened by uranium proposals in WA no longer have to worry about the threat of uranium mining. And we thank each of them for their time and their effort and their guidance that we get and receive from them. Um, because as you heard, they're all frightened of this um, industry. Our third and final speaker, um, many of you will know, um, the former and first woman Premier of WA, long-serving CCWA's Executive Board President, Professor Carmen Lawrence. Carmen's generous time and effort and expertise to ensure that CCWA is a strong and, ef and effective in its environmental advocacy is unwavering, respected and successful in achieving results for the environment and which future generations will be grateful. I'm delighted to introduce Carmen to the stage and Carmen will conclude by acknowledging CCWA's nuclear-free campaign and the importance this campaign has played within the organisation. Thanks, Carmen. Microphone there? Just yeah. leave it be? I think so. Okay. Thank you. And I hope, I hope the people online can hear. Is that okay if I leave the microphone down? Seems to be. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to begin by uh, paying my respects to the tradi traditional owners to acknowledge that we're meeting on Wajak Noongar land and to emphasize, if it needs emphasizing after that wonderful little presentation, how critical it is to our indigenous brothers and sisters that the uranium stays in the ground. Any of you who have talked to those communities and the people in them know how passionately they feel about uh, this campaign and how much they've contributed to it, working with CCWA. So thank you to Mia for putting this together and for KA for today and for the many people who've been involved. One of the things that struck me about it, I was a bit of a ring in for today, to be honest, Piers was going to do this, but in the end could not. But one of the things that really struck me is that these are very practical, thoughtful analyses of the current state of the four approvals and also the various exploration licenses that exist now in Western Australia. And the opportunity that's presented by the fact that the uh, environmental approvals are coming to their end at the moment, that the state government has an express commitment to stop uh, uranium mining. So there's an obvious point there to hold them to their word on that. And as uh, you were saying, KA, and as Mia has said too, to legislate, to make this uh, beyond doubt and we have to say that for the first time in the history of the Labor Party, uh, as a former Premier of the Labor Party, uh, with Labor Party badging, it's the first time the Labor Party has had any ability to control the upper house. People have always, uh, I think, misunderstood the extent to which they've had the capacity to do some of these things. Now there is no excuse. This is absolutely possible uh, for them to do in a responsible way, knowing that these companies are in financial trouble as most of them are, unable in any case to complete the work that they had indicated they would after the Barnett government gave them approval. So it's a perfect moment on every front. And as we know, um, West Australia has been a holdout state in many respects on this front. We have got a community who I'm sure Jo Valentine will tell you because she was elected on this very platform, the, the anti-nuclear platform, that West Australia in some ways has been a leader on this and that we have managed to hold these uh, mines at bay and that there is no nuclear industry to speak of in Western Australia. And so it's, I think with the support of the community, it would be possible to take these final steps and, and uh, if you like, bury the industry forever. I've just started reading um, Ian Lowe's uh, latest book. Some of you will know Ian. Uh, and he's been working in this area for a very long time. He's a physicist, you might know, and it's called The Long Half-Life, and it's the history of the nuclear industry in Australia. And it's important for us to remember, I think, because what Ian points out in his uh, trajectory uh, th through from the very first uh, instances of uh, the uh, discovery of the possibilities of nuclear um, fusion and fission is that the nuclear industry never gives up and as we were saying earlier, they have reappeared in the guise of being saviors uh, under the climate change banner. So it's important, I think, that we do take these steps. And as I say, finally, 
conclude the chapter in Western Australia. Most people decided, I think, years, even decades ago, particularly in this state, that there was no place in Australia for a nuclear industry. There's been mining, certainly, but the rest of it has never occurred. And that's because it's never enjoyed community support in this country. Because of the fundamental problems that everybody knows about and that uh, CCWA and others have been campaigning on for a very long time. Firstly, nuclear waste management. I won't repeat the problems to this audience because you know it well, but that's a continuing problem. It's a problem that's never been solved. It's never gone away. Hi, everyone. I think they must be experiencing a technical issue at their end. So we'll just hold tight for a moment and hopefully it reconnects. While they're working it out, we've got some very great people online as well. Maybe um, Jim or Dave, you might have something to add while we wait. Yeah, I can if you want, Mayor. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. Um, well, I have to admit that I've only heard part of this, this webinar, which was great, but um, so apologies if I'm doubling up, but I guess my main way into these issues is the global uranium market. Would it be useful to give a short summary of where things are at to frame the Australian debates or has that already been done, Mia? Okay. A little bit, but a little bit, but a quick snapshot could be good. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the news could hardly be better, really. Uh, since Fukushima and partly because of Fukushima, the uranium price has been in a tailspin, and there's always this assumption that it has to rise at some stage but it hasn't. And one of the most useful factoids that helps explain the whole thing is that in anticipation of a nuclear renaissance, global uranium production increased by 50%, uh, but demand for that uranium didn't increase at all. So that neatly explains why the price has been horrendous and also why there's been a growing glut of uranium around the world simply stockpiled. And that stockpile is... Um, enough to power all of the world's reactors for about eight years. So it's massive. The thing that has changed in the past year or so, past 18 months is uh, so much production has been taken offline, partly because of uh, the pandemic and partly because it's just not profitable. So they're finally starting to, to eat into that stockpile, that eight years stockpile of uranium. So, you know, maybe in a few years time, there's, uh, you know, demand and supply will match up and there'll be some pressure for increased prices and some rationale for, <clears throat> for a uranium mine in Australia. But you wouldn't bet on it because it's been so depressed for so long um, and the industry has lost so much. And uh, I would expect that it will be in, in a depression for a, another five to ten years or so. I think we might have Carmen back but I wonder if we can hear her. She's just finished. Great timing. We're now coming to the end of the presentation um, and we're going to open it up to the floor um, here to the first call to go online and see if we can get any questions online. Um, but if there's anyone that has questions for Carmen, for Steve, for Mia, um, to ask, um, we'll go to, did you, was that a hand up? No, I was straight. <laughs> but if there's anyone with um, any questions or comments, yep. I'll give you the microphone so that people online can hear you. They might not be able to see you. Uh, doesn't um, Andrew Forrest have a big interest? Mulder Rock project that's pretty resource money resources for thankful on time. Like that, so don't have investment in Mulder Rock for many resources, but um does Mia or Steve, do you want to um I mean, how seriously Twiggy takes the project or its economic viability 
is, you know, is one question. Whether he's just kind of donating to his mates is another question. It's it's not really clear to me how seriously um, he takes the project. Um, but it is also worth noting that um, Twiggy was fighting, actively fighting in court, a uranium project on uh, one of his stations. And he was using many of those same arguments that traditional owners make about, um, about rights to determine what happens on your country and about the um, personal connection to country. So it was very interesting that he could, at one hand, say he didn't want uranium on his country because of the dangers and risks and then go and fund and finance a company to do the same thing on somebody else's country. There's a lot of um, nodding and shaking your heads at this um, and unbelievable um, that that happened. Thanks, Leah. Did you have a question up the back here? I'm walking around, sorry if I'm making you all dizzy on Zoom, my goodness. Thank you. Um, so this is the first time we've actually um, come to one of the exceptions. So uh, firstly, congratulations for doing this for so long. Um, it's amazing to hear about your project and your passion. Um, my question is, I guess, as a first observer, it's, um, yes, you're doing great work in stopping this and making sure that it doesn't go ahead, but talk, talking about um, uh, a safe place for our laborers that will generate jobs and something that won't impact the community, what would be a, a good and a green environmental project that would create enough resources for us to move away from um, fossil fuels, from carbon, um, that is still damaging to the communities. Um, so what, what uh, I, do you guys look into uh, an alternative? That's a good question. Is that, uh, Carmen, would you like to, yeah? <laughs> um, look, one of the things that we're doing right at the moment is um, expanding a program we call Clean Space. And what we're trying to do there is provide the analyses, the research, and then the, the persuasive material as well uh, to ensure that there's community support for this, that it's, that it's regionally sensitive, which is depends on where you are and what things are promoted. So that we're, we're trying to put before government a demonstration of the opportunity for employment beyond fossil fuels, beyond uranium, in areas that are likely to be you know, like socially sensitive, environmentally thoughtful, um, and still generate plenty of employment and economic activity in the state. So there is a huge list of possibilities that we play. But it just seems that as a state, we're so hooked on this resource extraction that we don't think beyond that. So it's kind of the role of this um, body, clean state. We've already insisted We've got uh, quite substantial resources now to expand its operation and to help it uh, more effective and broader its scope. Great, thanks, Carmen. Um, and there's also a website called Don't Nuke the Climate um, that Mia and Dave Sweeney and a few others are running that um, and online and stuff. So we can give you more details at the end of this um, event um, about what they're doing as well to push renewables as well. Um, Mia, did you want to say anything to that question? I think Carmen probably covered it. I couldn't quite hear. Sorry, it's a bit muffled this end. Mm. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, then maybe we'll take a question online then and see if that works. If there's any questions, um, you can come from you, Maggie. Um, only one at this stage, which is just around um, what can people, specifically people who don't live in WA, but I think people in WA also, um, do to help to keep the uranium in the ground? What can people in WA and elsewhere do to keep uranium in the ground? Oh, very simple. Get a help you collect your bottoms um, <laughs> and go and knock on politicians' door, your local politicians, and say you don't want this in the state. And when we do make the call, to say that we need to be out in front of Parliament House to explain to them that they should be doing that, to take the day off work and go and have a look. Because we'll be encouraging our people to do that. But I think it's um, this is our opportunity. We actually can't let this one walk away. Mm. And um, 
the more pressure we put on government at the moment, the better we're going to be in the long term. Because um, they need to know early and loud that this is what we expect out of the government. We've been talking about it for 20 years. Well said, and I think that that's um, a really, really great point that um, it is a labour platform policy and that we have to keep them to that. To that, I know Jo Val has got a burning question up the back here and we'll pop it over to her and maybe that will be the last uh, question for the night. Maybe, we'll see. Thanks, KA, and thanks, Carmen and Stephen Mayer. Fabulous presentation. It's so good. I just feel so excited as though we're nearly yeah. there you know, after. Well, for me, it's been more than 40 years. Um, and I'm so glad, Carmen, that you mentioned the nuclear weapons connection, the nuclear testing that went on at Maralinga, and the fact that we did have physicists in Australia in the 60s who thought that Australia should build its own nuclear weapons, did it, and, and so on. So they don't go away, these doozies. However, we've now got this opportunity with the international treaty to ban nuclear weapons and Labor federally has said it will support that. So that's another push. We've got to get the state government to legislate for goodness sake, but we also need federal Labor to be really strong about joining that list of countries. Now there are about 52 countries that have ratified the new United Nations Treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And Australia should be there. We've got no chance, of course, with the coalition, not whatsoever. So, you know, we need to work on changing the government for many reasons. And this needs to be something that we don't forget to lobby about, that treaty to ban nuclear weapons. We want that very clearly on Labor's agenda. Fabulous, Joe. Um, Uncle Ben, have you got, yes, something to say? Giving back to Andrew Forrest, he, he's got money to buy people. He's done it for the Aboriginal people up there. Oh, hello, Mia. Hi, Andrew Forrest. He could, he could rent a tribe and everything. He got the money. He's done it down over on four corners and everything. But, you know, the dollar stops with the government and the minister. He buys them off, well, that's it. Uh, the Wogger Rock and Mogger Rock. I went up to Wogger Rock at Kew with some people. We had a look at that sacred place with them. They're not talking about destroying that, are they? Well, good. Anyway, that's, we're going to keep fighting this and keep up the good work, Mia. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle. Thanks, Uncle Ben. Um, I'm not sure if there's any more questions um, online, but that question about um, about uh, how you can um, help and be a part of this campaign, I think Steve is on the right track. When we do um, call out, we need all of you to be there. If Labor do approve or extend any of these approvals in January 2022 or December 16, actually, is the first one, which is Mulder off, which is the one that we're really, really watching, they are pushing the December 16 model off. We need people to be ready to go and ready to go to Parliament, but also the AGM of giving resources is hugely in November. Um, we've had a huge turnout tonight, so there's some way that you're finding out about this information. Tell your friends, tell your families to, when the call is there, and it will be there, well, hopefully not, hopefully it's a celebration. But if there is a call, we want to motivate people, we want to get people up to parliament, we want to get people to the resources AGM, and it's usually at the end of December. But for people that are afar, from afar from um, around this country, you can um, help by just sending in uh, letters and um, donations are always helpful to, for the campaign to keep going. Um, and just keep supporting messages. Messages of support to go into the communities is really, really valuable. But just um, just uh, download the report, read the report, and like Steve said and Mia said, said you know send that report on, leave it in places where people will see it and read it, um, and just keep sharing that message. It is downloadable on the CCWA website. Um, if you search for it, it will come up. Um, but I think that that's all um, 
we have time for unless there is any more uh, burning questions. Um, I just wanted to say a massive thanks to all of our speakers tonight, to Uncle Ben and to Daniel for welcoming the country. It's really special that you're here um, and you've stayed out late tonight um, to hear these messages. So thank you and to all the speakers, to Carmen, to Steve and AMWU, um, to me, I'm particularly to put that report together, thank you, but also the people that have put this guide on, um, the CCWA Sarah and um, Steph, who wasn't here, um, a massive thanks. Um, what did I do next? So, there's also a subscription to our New Zealand News. I put together each week. Um, you can subscribe to that and receive news, actions, and events that happen. Um, and there is a lot that's going on, so you can subscribe to that and receive that from ourselves each week. Um, and that's really good to, to keep the motivation going. Um, and also, just to reiterate those free asks that we're saying to Labor, and that is to don't extend the approval to rehabilitate the existing um, contaminated mine site and to permanently ban uranium mining. But like get that legislation in there. The free arts, they're very clear and they're not outside of anything that we've heard tonight that we're asking that's unrealistic, which is a platform policy. So keep those messages. Whenever you see a minister, whenever you see a media opportunity, please write in and, and, and try and keep driving that message. Um, from all of us now here at CCWA, thank you. And um, there's a conference coming up. Um, the CCWA conference is happening um, on the 24th of September. Um, and there's some flyers floating around the, uh, the room. So we're getting to that. There's also some food, tea and coffee. Please help us finish that off so we don't have to take it home. But those on Zoom, thanks for hanging in there. And sorry about all the tech issues, both live here and also online. Um, but lots and lots of love. Stay well, stay warm, and stay connected to each other. Thanks very much. Thank you.